I'm sure there will be several questions, but uh, we will move now to the Q&A and uh, I will uh, ask my colleague, uh, Professor Golfras to check on the Q&A &A box and to see if we have some questions. Thank you for all speakers. And uh, after the Q&A, we will have closing uh, remarks for a fantastic conference. Please go ahead, uh, Dr. Gulfras. Uh, Dr. Moyes, thank you very much. And uh, uh, much appreciated to all our uh, speakers. Excellent talks uh, from everybody. What I would do with regards to the questions, I think best way to uh, handle these is I would take one individual at a time and ask one one question each and then we'll we'll go in circles if you like uh, so everybody gets the opportunity in terms of uh, uh, their questions being uh, raised uh, so just to start off um, get the ball rolling so to speak um, if I can uh, address this questions to this question to dr Ifat. Um the the question is from one of the in fact, let me, let me ask one of the, my questions first before, before we even go into that. That's an interesting question. Um, uh, you, you mentioned about NF-kappa B, uh, Dr. Rifat, um, in terms of its regulation in COVID-19. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, is there any indications, for example, from the in silico analysis that you have done, mm -hmm. what the potential upstream so the signaling pathways in regards to NF kappa B. I mean NF kappa B. All three talks. It seems to be a central uh, yeah. a factor, and being a major transcription factor, of course, is going to lead to all the downstream signaling pathways, including your your cytokine storm. So I'm just wondering, instead of going downstream, if we can target what the upstream signal, what the viral component, for example, which is actually uh, uh, triggering the NF kappa B, maybe that would be a, a good target to uh, address. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so from our, and as you know, NF kappa B is quite complex. And I think uh, it, it's also by uh, Prof. Uh, Alangari and uh, Prof. Uh, Mahwaj. Um, uh, so, in, in, in immune system, um, it's still a work in progress, basically, most of the immune cells. Like recently, there are NK, they reported TLR9, you know, activation in NK cells, you know, can lead to uh, switching of the NK cells to do some downstream, um, you know, changes. So for us, um, what we found is there are some links with, uh, I think, TLR9 and TLR3, uh, there's some indication of it, but we are looking at the, as well, like the way we did with the C1Q. But the C1Q itself is also an interesting one because it's, it's one of this complement that links to the TNF. So, uh, so we're looking at that C1Q family and trying to see how the COVID may interact with, you know, using or manipulate, let's say, these molecules. But obviously, the, the TLRs, the TLR receptors, uh, are, are another, uh, you know, molecules that we are trying to investigate to see whether. There is a link between the activation of the virus by those molecules and plus the um, downstream activation of that. So what we found from our data is that th there is a definite, um, I would say, so signaling through the nf kappa B. But as you mentioned, uh, you know, the nf kappa B is quite complex. So we, we did. We are now focusing on more the upstream. Because if you go downstream, you have this kind of cytoplasmic layer, the processing. And as you saw, uh, in, in the uh, subunit, in, in, you know, like P65, P50, th these ones are very difficult to capture if they're up or down regulated because they shuttle between the nuclear and the cytoplasm. And it's that shuttling, you know, if it's disrupted, I think the shift happens with the immune response at, at that level. So, you know, so yeah, I think we're looking at probably this, uh, the complement, this one q TNF, and some of the TNF family of genes plus the TLRs to see upstream whether we can have some uh, idea of the beginning of, let's say, the, the, the infection. So once the person gets infected, 
exactly you know which molecules are involved in that. Um, plus, uh, I think just mention quickly on this. Uh, uh, I know a lot of the people who want to work on COVID. Uh, it's difficult to do it because of the biological safety level four. But what we did here is like we're not looking at the infection, but like we said, so we're looking at um, you know taking those molecules and trying to see can we almost like reverse engineer the process how the virus works, you know? So if we can, uh, so you have like the hypothesis, okay, it could be, you know, the C1, QTNF, maybe TLR3 and TLR9. If we can uh, infect it and use the bioinformatics, do we get the signature for the virus? So it's a mixture of bioinformatics and molecular uh, work as well, trying to mimic the, the role of the virus. So yeah, I think looking at TLRs and TNFs, Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Just, just a, uh, so before we move on, then it's a very related question from one of the audiences. Uh, the question is how much is the comorbidity a com confounding factor in, in, in your analysis? Uh, yeah, I, I think those cases were not really, I think they were young people. I mean, they didn't have, this is from the autopsies from Italian people in the, in the initial data set. And then when we did the validation, a lot of the validation came to uh, Dr. Havina Safar and also from Germany. So many of them, they were young, you know, healthy. There, there, there isn't much comorbidity to account for the effect, I guess. You know, so I, I think we, we thought, you see, that's a good question. In the beginning, do you remember, like, they thought, oh, like, it affects elderly, you know, and then, yeah, maybe, you know. And then they thought, oh, it's like, you know, if you only have diabetic or asthma, then you can have more. But actually now we know that it's not the case. So, you know, so yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. We may come back if we have time, uh, Dr. Fat, we may come back again to you. Uh, yeah. Question for uh, Dr. Sybil. Um, in terms of the uh, CTLA for the immunoglobulin fusion uh, drug uh, you were talking about in your, in your, in your uh, session, um, how about its, its, its side effect? I mean, you touched on it very uh, briefly, but the fact that you know many of these intracellular signaling pathways, as we mentioned earlier on, whether it's the the mTOR pathway or the start pathway, are involved in numerous uh, uh, sort of downstream actions. In terms of side effects with with this stroke, um, can it kind of sort of shed the light on that? Any any? Uh, so. Um... Actually, I mentioned that in the several three, uh, in the three examples that we showed, there are uh, side effects and depending on the drug, uh, there might be some manifestation in the patient. That's why, and to date, those uh, therapies with uh, biological molecules are basically used to, uh, let's say, minimize or uh, uh, make the condition of the patient better, but they are not yet an ultimate treatment especially with the off targets let's say of these therapies so so mainly they suggest uh, the use of these uh, to uh, to stabilize a little bit the patient's condition until uh, when possible and depending on the case uh, a definitive uh, for example hematopoietic stem cell uh, transplant but definitely uh, uh, dr uh, al Angali or Dr. Hamoudi can also, from the perspective of uh, MDs, uh, maybe have also other inputs. Just one, one, one. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, just just one, one, one additional question here is uh, with regards to precision medicine, um, in terms of its costs. Uh, when you boil it down to the patient level, where do you see this in, 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 in how quickly and how soon do you think this will be implemented in, in the near future that we can go to the patient level and exactly treat the patient according to the, to, to the data that we generate from, from, from these studies? Okay, I think that to answer your question, I have to uh, be talking from two sides. From the side of Sibel, who was in at Boston Children's Hospital, working uh, with uh, the team of Dr. Raif Jaha, who, who is one of the pioneers in the field, and where the uh, treatments uh, are uh, more available to the patients, and the other Sibel who is currently in Lebanon, suffer, uh, where patients are suffering from uh, 
well, they are still, uh, they cannot even afford the price of a genetic test, let's say, or, or other just basic I mean, flow cytometry tests or other essential tests. And with what we're suffering currently with the economic uh, crisis, uh, we're also having a problem in just uh, finding uh, IVIGs for the patients. So, um, so I, I believe that in the U.S. I used to see my colleagues uh, who you, who were researchers, but at the same time seeing patients telling us about how promising uh, a beta sept is. I can remember one of my colleagues telling me how uh, uh, the response of his patient was, where, whereas here it's going to take a long time to reach that. And we hope that one day we will be able to... Uh, to um, make uh, the possibility and the availability of these uh, promising drugs to the patients. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sibyl. Dr. Hamoudi, you wanted to say something? Uh, okay. No, no, I'm just, uh, it's okay. It's just Sorry. been focused on you and so I thought maybe mm -hmm. you want to. Uh, question for uh, Dr. Abdullah. Um, uh, consanguinity is obviously a, a major sort of concern within the, the, the GCs uh, countries. Are the PDI, PIDs more common? And if so, any particular conditions that you see in, in, in within the region in, in, in Saudi, for example? All right, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this is an important question. Uh, yes, consanguinity uh, increase uh, the risk of uh, autosomal recessive diseases of you know, uh, all uh, varieties or differences, whether they are in immunity or metabolic diseases or otherwise. And uh, the issue I think with consanguinity is when it happens successively over uh, several generations. I mean, it, when it happens at one generation, probably it is not an, uh, an issue. But when, when you see like three, four, five generations, all of them, uh, you know, consanguineous marriages, then that risk is, is really become clinically uh, significant. The uh, studies uh, showed that very clearly. For example, in particular, uh, for, uh, primary immune deficiency diseases, there is a, uh, a study published by uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Fumodo Musa from King Faisal Hospital, where they used uh, the trick. Uh, uh, technology to uh, screen for skid patients, newborn screening, that is. And uh, it was found that the risk is, uh, could be uh, 10 to 20 times that uh, in the West of uh, severe combined immune deficiencies. Um, the same issue is also noticed, you know, in other countries where uh, Consanguinous marriages is quite common uh, in the Middle East, uh, for example, in, in Pakistan, Turkey, Iran, and also Egypt and elsewhere. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, that is that is a, a contributing uh, definitely a contributing factor, and people need to be aware of that issue. We hope that in terms of, I mean, in future sort of direction wise, um, if we are able to, to identify exact sort of mutations or exact uh, uh, defects in the or carrier within the family potentially, then we could advise at least in terms of uh, genetic counseling and so on and so forth um, uh, in, in, in the future. Just one more question. I know that we, we're exactly at 2.45, but to be fair, I, I think I've asked two questions to everybody, so I think uh, you deserve one more question. Um, in, in terms of the TL3, I remember in one of your slides, I'm more of an infectious diseases person, so I'm going okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go from that angle. Um, the TL3 receptor, and you were talking about in terms of the intracellular, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, RNA viruses being in, uh, sort of... Uh, predisposed, if you like, or more susceptible. I totally understand. But what I don't understand is the DNA ones. Where, where does herpes, being a DNA right. virus, uh, how does that come into this? And why are these patients more predisposed to DNA viruses? I wish I understand that too. Uh, it is, uh, 
this, these are some of the surprising things, and there are many other examples that we, uh, in the world of, uh, you know, primary immune deficiency diseases that we don't have a clear explanation to. But these, uh, these kind of observations also uh, lead the way to interesting discoveries. Uh, as I said in the beginning of my presentation, many of uh, a lot of our understanding of the immune system came from discoveries of genetic defects leading to uh, inborn neurons of immunity. So uh, hopefully, I mean, uh, as you know, these pathways uh, are never uh, isolated. They work in collaboration with so many other pathways and it is a hugely complex. We try to simplify it when we talk about it, uh, but uh, the reality is that it is very complex. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, uh, I just want to add to uh, Dr. Al Anjari that so it's interesting you, you also presented the CBM complex. And I think the BCL10, uh, because we worked on it yeah. for a while, it's not really well understood, you know. Uh, in some of the lymphomas, uh, I used to work on, you know, hematopathology. So in most lymphoma, when you have overexpression of BCL10, it goes to the nucleus, you know. So when it's uh, fused to the IgH uh, receptor, but we never understood whether these molecules, did they have different functions? Is it like P53, you know, it doesn't do something different in the nucleus as opposed to the cytoplasm. So maybe uh, looking at the CBM complex in conjunction with the GLRs, like you mentioned, the synergy between them, which might help to understand the immune response in some of those uh, diseases as well. Okay. Precisely, I mean, to be honest, it, 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 as the Dr. Dr. Uh, Abdullah said, uh, hit the nail on the head. These things are so yeah. complex that, I mean, I, I remember when P53 came on the scene, you know, we were just thinking about in terms of, uh, uh, arresting cell cycle, but later we realized that actually that's that's only a, a tip of the iceberg. You know what I mean? Oh, it, it, it triggers also apoptosis and so on and so forth. So I think there's multiple interactions depending on the on the the, the, the different conditions. So it's been an excellent uh, session. I think Dr. Moise, is there? I think are we? We've... No, I think uh, yeah. everything was perfect. Everyone was in time and great presentations, very exciting. And now uh, we should hand it to the conference organizer for the closing remarks and the awards. Thank you. Thank you so much, our great speakers. Thank you, everybody. Much appreciated. Excellent talks. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Moise, and thank you, Dr. Bulfaraz, and thank you to all our speakers. Um, we don't have a formal closing ceremony, but uh, this is where we wrap up the ninth banner of Human Genetics Conference. It's been quite a busy couple of days. Um, we hope you enjoyed attending the conference as much as we enjoyed organizing it. And I hope you found the lectures educational and informative. Um, so with that, a sincere thank you to all our speakers and poster presenters and to our scientific committees uh, who selected them. Uh, a big thank you also to our sponsors and supporters and to everyone at the Sheikh Hamdan Award for Medical Sciences who helped make this event possible. Uh, finally, thanks to everyone who attended and engaged and a big congratulations to the winners of the poster awards uh, and the competitions. You can, uh, you can see this on your screen right now. You will also find this list of winners in the announcement sections in a while. We look forward to your participation at future CAGS events. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Safe. Stay safe, everybody. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Soon, uh, Friday will not be a weekend. For you. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. But I think some of us are probably, yes, yeah. <laughs> whether it's weekend or not, we'll, we'll, we'll continue on working kind of thing. <laughs> okay. Thank Goodbye. You. So we can leave now. Yeah. Yes, you can. Thank you so much. Take, take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.